Um, you know, my father continued to be very active throughout his, uh, you know, the whole time that we were in Denmark. And he actually started the BHRO, the Bahrain Human Rights Organization in Copenhagen, which again focused on the issue and the plight of political prisoners in Bahrain. And in 2001, when the situation changed and um, Hamad bin Isa al-Khalifa became the emir of Bahrain and then announced himself king later on, um, he, promised, he promised to allow people in exile to come back to Bahrain. And he promised a constitutional monarchy, which he failed to deliver on. But he did allow people to go back. And my family, for my parents, their existence outside of Bahrain had always been something temporary. And so as soon as they got the opportunity to pack their bags and go back to Bahrain, that was the first thing that they did. And so we moved back to Bahrain in 2001 when I was 14 years old. And that's when my father founded the Bahrain Center for Human Rights. And things shut down pretty quickly. This is a pretty horrible picture, but this is uh, from 2005. Uh, yeah. he, was, he was being already beaten then. Um, and then the pro-revolution happens. And can you describe the situations of when, how he was arrested and stuff like that? Sure. Um, on the 9th of April, 2011, my so father. The pro-revolution is Valentine. Yes, 14th of February. And then the crackdown, of course, happened in mid-March when the Saudi and the UAE troops came into the country. And that's when the widespread violence, systematic violence by the government started. And on the 9th of April, 2011, my family, um, including my father, my sisters, and my brothers-in-law, were all in my sister's apartment. And uh, they received news that the riot police had already broken into uh, our apartment. And they were looking for my father. And so my father told my family that he would, first of all, they got my niece, who was one years old at the time, uh, out of the apartment. And he asked my brothers-in-law to leave, who refused to leave. And so he asked the, my family members not to respond or not to try and prevent the arrest in any way, because it was well known by then that anyone who resists or tries to intervene in any arrest either gets arrested as well or gets beaten, as happened with the case of my uncle when they arrested him and his wife was sexually assaulted by the, by the police. And so within 30 seconds, they had broken down the door. They entered the apartment. And before my father, as he was telling them that he was going to go with them willingly, uh, they grabbed him from the neck. They dragged him down the staircase. And they started to beat him violently. There were about 15 or 20 of them. Um, my three brothers-in-law were also taken and beaten. Uh, they were taken downstairs to the bottom apartment and beaten as well. And by the time they were finished with my father, he was unconscious. Um, while they were beating him, my sister Zainab heard him saying continuously that he couldn't breathe. And she tried to intervene, saying, he was going to go with you willingly, so why are you beating him? And so one of the officers, who we think, or we now know as Bedr al ghaith who continues to be a police officer today, um, ordered that they arrest my sister as well. And when my mother tried to intervene to stop them from taking my sister, she was pushed back on the staircase, and they were all locked in the apartment upstairs. And when they took my father away, he was unconscious. They had, uh, he received a hard blow to the face, which left, uh, left him with about six fractures in his jaw. And he currently has to have around 34 or 36 metal plates that hold his jaw together with his face. Um, and they took him away unconscious. Of course, my family didn't know whether he was alive or dead. And right afterwards, my sister was tweeting about this, which is how I found out what happened, as I was in the United States at the time. Um, she basically, the first thing she did is started cleaning up the blood because she knew that her one-year-old daughter would be coming home and she didn't want her to see that. Um, and of course, what happens in Bahrain is that when you're arrested, you disappear. They arrested two of my brothers-in-law along with my father, although they have no political affiliations, are not human rights activists, um, and are not involved at all in the movement. Uh, but because they're related to us, they were arrested as well. And they were also severely tortured while imprisoned and released afterwards. Um, but what happens always in Bahrain, especially in 2011, is that when you're arrested, you disappear. And for some time, your family does not know whether you're alive or dead. And of course, we know as human rights defenders, and I've, I remember I talked about this with the Special Rapporteur on Torture from the United Nations as well, one of the times when we know that torture happens the most is when people are put in incommunicado detention. It's when they're cut off from the rest of the world that we have serious concerns about mistreatment and torture. And this is what happened and continues to happen to political prisoners in Bahrain. Uh, just recently, one of my colleagues, Naji Fatir, was arrested and he, was, he disappeared for about three days. And we still have serious concerns and we don't know what his situation or his well-being is. So this is something that not only happened in 2011, but continues to happen today. Coming back to your father, he was presently, he came up with that he, he was out of his 
disappearance and he was put on trial and he was given a life sentence for all his beastly monstrousness. Yeah. That is correct, yeah. And one of his responses to that was a hunger strike. Yes, um, so he was sentenced, he, start, he did several hunger strikes. After he was arrested, he was at the military hospital um, where he continued to be tortured while at the hospital after he had received surgery. And then he was moved to El Gurain prison, which is the military prison, where he continued to be tortured as well. Um, and at one point, because of uh, attempted rape on him by the police officers in charge, he had to continuously beat his head against the floor to prevent them from raping him, uh, which again caused damage to his face. Um, but he, and he did initiate a hunger strike at that time to try and prevent the torture that was happening. He conducted, like I said, several hunger strikes along with other uh, political prisoners in Bahrain. But the longest hunger strike that he did was 110 days, which happened last year, and which almost cost him his life, and it ended with the government force-feeding him. Let me, let me stop for a second, because mm -hmm. it's at this point where I, where I really began to hear about your family, but partly through, uh, through what you were doing, but also partly through your, your sister at that point, was uh, on the outside. This is Zainab, yes. how old is she? Zainab is 29. Okay. And Don't tell her I said her age, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've got some pictures of her. She's famous for just doing things by herself, <laughs> sitting in the middle of the street, um, trying to block traffic, trying to get attention to the plate of her father at that point on the hunger strike. Um, down here, can you just tell what's happening? This was in November, because I have a little piece of video of, of this, but tell on the, on the right here what happened. That's in November. That was one of the first um, appearances for Zainab during the uprising. Um, she didn't know that she was being filmed by actually a New York uh, Times reporter. And uh, they had been attacking the youth in Sitra, the, the uh, one of the villages. Yeah, the, the riot police. Uh, had been attacking the protesters. And for, so she attempted to stop the riot police from continuously arresting no, no, or no, attacking no, let's, people. Let's just watch this, because this is kind of amazing to watch. <laughs> That's her by herself. pay in this country to get footage up like that not shown on TV as much as you said the famous tank, man from the tank in Finland Square, but, but I know who does the pain, and I know who, who, how it happens. But anyway, so she is continually being thrown, thrown in jail, and then gets out after a while, and gets thrown in again. How many, how much has I've lost count, but I think it's around nine times that she's been in and out of prison now. She's also been beaten severely several times. She's been shot in the leg with a tear gas canister. Um, she's been subjected to quite a lot in the past two years. Uh, she's in prison right now. Yes. And uh, she recently released, uh, just around the time that we were all so pleased with ourselves about Martin Luther King and the March in Washington and the anniversary and so forth, she released a letter which was clearly rhyming off of his, a letter from prison. And the, it's an amazing document. You can find it online. Uh, the Zainab al Khawaja uh, letter from a Bahraini prison. Uh, but part of it, if she keeps on quoting Martin Luther King, and in an amazing moment, she's talking about how the doctor, because she, she goes on hunger strike too, I guess, and, and at one point the doctor is, why are you doing this? And she says something about Martin Luther King, and she gives him her Martin Luther King book. And, and uh, but at one point, I thought she she turns from just talking about Martin Luther King in general to to uh, well this passage. This is aimed more at us, so I think you, you might read it for us. Sure. Uh, it says, as I read through Martin Luther King's words, I found myself wishing he was alive. I found myself wondering what he would have to say about the U.S. administration's support of Bahraini dictators what he would say about turning a blind eye to the blood and tears being spilt in the quest for freedom. All I had to do was turn a page, 
and this time Martin Luther King spoke not to me, but to you, to America. John F. Kennedy said, this those, is Martin King talking. John F. Kennedy said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Increasingly, by choice or by accident, this is the role our nation has taken. The role of those who make peaceful revolution impossible by refusing to give up the privileges and the pleasures that come from the immense profits of overseas investment. I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. Martin Luther King there come back in prison, and uh, what happens to her daughter, by the way? Um, well, her daughter is currently way, with... Here's a picture of your mother with her. Yes. Your mother's pretty amazing, but then this is her daughter, Jude. Yeah. So Jude is three years old now, and she's currently living with her father, who was previously detained and tortured. And I think the most difficult thing for Zainab right now is that for the, almost the two months that she's been in prison, she has not been able to see her daughter. She's been prevented family visits, consular visits, lawyer visits, um, even access to sanitary items like shampoo and soap and so on. Uh, and even further to that, she's not been allowed outside of the prison facility. Usually prisoners are allowed to go outside um, to at least see the sky or the sun. Zainab has not been allowed outside of her cell for almost two months now. Um, on an earlier visit, um, there was one of the, she, she tweets by the name Angry Arabia, right? Yes. And, um, uh, and she uh, had a it's told a story about this has been maybe six months ago where she was able while in prison to hear from her father mm -hmm. on, on the phone. And these are, tweets are as you know just very short things, but this is a a, a sequence. Maybe you can read this description of the conversation she had with. Your father. Sure, so she tweeted this after she was released from prison. And she wrote, so that's a total of three months that I did not see my father. During my two months in detention, I was allowed only one call to my dad. I don't want to share the difficulties of prison, but I do want to share that one phone call when I at last heard his voice. I remember running out of my cell when the prison guard told me that I could speak to my father. I couldn't believe it. And I remember as soon as I said hello, I heard another prison guard on the other side of the phone call, shouting at my father. Don't speak about politics, he shouted. And I could hear the irritation in the voice of my always proud father. It's always awkward when you have a few minutes to speak to someone you love, with police standing by listening to your conversation. But my father started with, listen, Zainab, you know they built a wall around our outdoor area instead of the fence. We used to be able to see the sea. We could see the first light of the sunrise but they didn't want the other prisoners to see us. The other day I sat with one of the, the other political prisoners, right before sunrise. He turned to me and started reading a poem. How difficult it is to have a wall between you and the sunrise. How difficult to try and claw your way to see a little light. As my father read me the poem, I felt all of the anger and sadness in me come to surface. Yes, a wall surrounds us. He waited knowing what I was thinking and feeling. Then he said, but Zainab, I listened to his poem, then I asked him not to leave. We sat and waited and waited in complete silence until the sun was high up in the sky. Then I turned to my friend and told him, the sun always rises higher than the wall. You'll be in pain only if you concentrate on the wall. But if you, if you look at the big picture, you'll realize that in the end, the wall is, in fact, insignificant. I, I was going to ask you, I, I have to find here on that. Okay. One last look at Jude before we leave her there. 